All right, so um, next up we have Lucy Parms. Uh, is a, Lucy is a water resource project manager for SWCA Environmental Consulting in Salt Lake City, Utah. She primarily manages study design, data collection, analysis, and synthesis for water quality projects in Utah and with a focus, is, with a focus sorry, on developing total maximum daily loads. She has over five years of experience in the natural resource field and has worked both professionally and academically on a variety of projects that include water quality and quantity investigations, microbial source tracking, non-point source identification, BMP implementation, watershed management and planning, and long-term environmental monitoring of hydrological ecosystem surfaces. Her career has enabled her to develop and demonstrate scientific proficiency and effectively communicate findings to various audiences. Lucy received her BS in natural resources from the University of South in Sewanee, Tennessee in 2005. <laughs> she earned her MS in water resources from the University of New Hampshire in 2012 with a research focus on spatial and temporal variation in the microbial degradation of dissolved organic matter in riverine systems. Sorry. She currently, <laughs> she currently lives in Salt Lake City. And Lucy actually just um, recently developed a white paper on MST for WACD this past summer and fall, which will be um, handed out after convention, so, which I think you'll cool. be talking a little bit about. Right? Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, yeah, so uh, this presentation, um, just kind of to, to set the tone, um, it, it, let's kind of zoom out a bit because it's, it's um, Melissa's presentation was kind of an advanced version of this presentation. So let's kind of take, take a step back and this is more of a sort of intro to the field of MST, um, kind of some general background information, um, methods and applications. Um, and Kathy, if it's okay with you, if you guys have questions as we go through the presentation, presentation feel free to ask um, I won't let us get too bogged down but uh, yeah we'll begin there so I wanted to start by talking about um, pathogen contamination of surface waters so there's going to be some repetition between what um, Melissa and I are presenting um, but something I found with this field is that repetition is a good thing because it really like hammers it home um, so contamination of surface waters by pathogens a major cause of water quality impairment listings in the US. So when we talk about pathogens, we're referring to viruses, bacteria, protozoa. They're fecal in origin and sourced from a uh, variety of animals. Um, and these different sources can pose different risks to human health. So implications for human health include, um, so this is kind of, sorry, cutting the slide off a bit. Sorry, let me see if. All right, so it is cutting the slide off a bit down here. Sorry about that. Um, I don't know why it's doing that. Uh, so anyway, implications for human health, gastrointestinal, respiratory, eye, ear, nose, throat, and skin diseases. Um, some of the issues that we've had with monitoring for pathogens directly, as Melissa's mentioned, there's a high diversity. They can occur in patchy, low concentrations, making them more difficult to detect. Um, and uh, they can be sometimes hard to quantify. So if we can't directly monitor for pathogens, then how do we currently assess uh, pathogen contamination? Um, and for the past century, it's been to monitor for our fecal indicator bacteria, so FIB. Um, and these are our E. coli, fecal coliforms, total coliforms. Um, so while they're not necessarily pathogens themselves, um, they are, you know, what the current water quality standards um, define. That's, that's kind of how we monitor um, our current water quality is by using these fecal indicator bacteria. Why were they selected? Well, they occur in high levels in sewage and feces, and they have, have shown a relationship in some circumstances to a uh, pathogen presence. Um, so some of the issues with using these traditional FIB, um, Differences in the fate and transport between the FIB and pathogens. Um, FIB have also been shown to adapt and persist in the natural environment. And one of the biggest issues, it's bolded in red here, that's kind of hard to see, uh, you can't identify individual sources. And um, due to the wide tr distribution of these FIB among different hosts. 
So what are our different sources of fecal contamination? Um, pretty obvious, humans, livestock, wildlife, um, basically anything that, that defecates. Um, and why well, this isn't working? Why do we care about understanding uh, these different fecal sources? Well, there's several reasons. One, understanding different source, fecal sources in a watershed allows us to accurately address uh, contamination issues. Um, so, you know, knowing where it comes from, we can kind of target what, re what resources we have. Um, it allows us to prioritize sites for um, remediation. So, in the sense that we do have limited funding, well, um, Understanding the source allows us to figure out where we want to put that funding. Um, evaluation of best management practices. And then, um, as I mentioned before, these different sources can have different implications for actual human health. So um, human feces have, the great, have been shown to have the greatest risk. That makes sense, because um, those, those pathogens have adapted to our environment. Um, relationships to other sources are less well-defined. Um, and so, it kind of brings us back to this question of, okay, so we know that it's important to understand our source of fecal contamination. How do we actually answer this question? And that brings us to microbial source tracking, the formal definition of which is a methodology designed to collect, isolate, identify, and measure a host-associated fecal indicator from an environmental sample. So the premise being that there are certain fecal microorganisms that are strongly associated with specific hosts and that identified characteristics of these host-associated organisms can be used as markers for fecal contamination from the host. Um, so if I can direct your attention to the diagram um, in the lower part of the slide here, to kind of reiterate that premise. So we have these fecal microorganisms that occur in water. Um, they display these unique characteristics. And we can identify these unique characteristics through various um, methods and then use them to actually identify a host. So the impetus being to determine the extent to which these fecal sources are influencing human health risk from contact with water and to attribute these uh, fecal sources to different um, hosts. So what are some potential applications for MST? Um, I think as probably most of you are familiar, the whole the TMDL process. Um, so MST can potentially be used as a support tool for source identification um, and also to gain stakeholder buy-in. Um, again, back to the, the uh, prioritization, so using MST um, as a way to really focus in on which impaired waters um, should we address first. So maybe ones that are um, primarily affected by human sources because those pose the greatest health risk um, can be a way that we can kind of figure out where to uh, target our resources. Um, direct limited resources towards effective mitigation strategies. Um, assist in modeling risk to public health through microbial quantitative risk assessments and again, um, to evaluate BMPs. So what are some of the, the more widely tested MSD methodologies? Um, so there are several different methods available, um, some of which have been more rigorously tested than others. Um, so Melissa talked quite a bit about the PCR, qPCR method. So again, this is kind of taking a step back and looking at kind of the broad array of uh, methods that have been used historically. Um, something important to note, there's no one method that can quantify all fecal bacteria sources or definitively identify the relative abundance of bacteria among multiple sources. Um, something I wanted to point out, this table um, is going to be included in uh, the white paper that Kathy mentioned, and it's kind of a summary of those methods that are available and that have been used historically. Um, and as you can see, it's, it can be overwhelming for someone who is new to the field. Um, and I'm not going to go through each of these individually, uh, but one thing I, I just kind of wanted to point out is 
that there are several methods available um, and it's important to um, select a method that speaks to your individual water quality issue in your specific watershed. So importance in choosing a method that speaks to that issue and having an understanding of potential sources before beginning the MST process. Uh, selection of an MST method should be based on carefully considered objectives and hypotheses that are clearly defined at the beginning of the study. And this is something I'm going to talk a bit more about um, when you go about designing the study, kind of the different steps that um, are important to take in order to make sure that you're designing a study that's going to give you results that can actually be useful. So MST methodologies, like I said, I'm not going to go into to great detail on all the different ones available, but something I did want to point out, um, kind of the broader classifications for these methods. We have culture dependent and culture independent, um, which is basically, um, you know, a culture dependent method involves um, actually growing a microbe in the lab versus a, a culture independent um, method where you can kind of skip that step. Then you have library dependent, library independent. Um, library dependent methods involve actually going out into your watershed ahead of time, um, collecting fecal samples from all known sources in that watershed, sending them to a lab, and, and having basically a reference database built that you can then compare when you go out and take a water sample, you can compare what's found in that water sample to your library. Um, obviously that, that is, is, uh, can be costly and pretty labor intense, going out into a watershed and collecting fecal samples from all the different sources. So that's your library dependent method classification. Then you have your library independent methods, um, which basically involves you know, direct extraction of DNA from a sample. Um, and those can potentially be much, you know, much more efficient. And then within those two broader classifications, we also have molecular, biochemical, um, and chemical methods. Molecular methods speaking more to the uh, genetic makeup, biochemical to physical characteristics that have formed as a result of environmental influences, and chemical methods, um, which refers to you know, using caffeine or optical brighteners. Um, and so this diagram may also look familiar. But basically, kind of how all these methods come together. Um, so you have your potential sources in a watershed. They're all you know, contributing. Um, so if you decide to go the library route, you would start by going out and collecting fecal samples from all of those sources. You can see, and then you build that library based on fecal samples from known sources. Um, then you go out, you collect your water samples, and you can either go culture-dependent route or the culture-independent route. Culture-dependent being you isolate and grow the bacteria in the lab, and then you can either um, compare it to that reference library database that you already have built. Um, and the different kind of, of methods involved there are ribotyping, PFG, RET-PCR, ARA, and CUP. So those are all culture dependent, library dependent. Um, you also have the option of using DNA to identify species specific to sources, and that's your culture dependent, library independent, or you can go the just direct DNA extraction route, look for these genetic markers that are specific to the source, and that's your PCR, qPCR. Culture independent, library independent. Lucy, do you why can't we just do one library for the state and let it go? Is this watershed specific or creek specific? Or why do we have to have our own library worked up? Watershed specific. Watershed. And they can also be um, even temporally specific in the sense that, so not only do you need to go collect fecal samples from known sources, but you need to collect them at different times of the year. And so that obviously that takes quite a bit of effort to build that. So um, you're familiar with Bear River, so we couldn't use the Bear River that they were using in Logan and Coalfield. I mean, I wouldn't recommend it personally, <laughs> no. 
So how is MSD currently being used? Um, so now I'm just going to go through a few, uh, few case studies. Um, case study one, Northern Idaho. So the MST method they use is PFG. So it's a library dependent, um, culture dependent method that gave them source discrimination for 20, sor 20 different sources. Um, there were two watersheds involved, Hauser Creek and Riley Creek, that are both uh, listed as impaired. And they were considered pretty high priority because they um, fed into um, downstream areas that were, um, had recreational use. So these folks used MST as a source characterization tool in, in their TMDL and also actually tried to calculate load reductions in their TMDL. Their study design was uh, bi-monthly from June to September for five different sites. Um, and so this is, like I said, a library dependent method. So they went out ahead of time, collected all their known fecal samples, and sent them to a lab uh, that I believe was in Washington State. And they found that there was no single animal was dominant, but when they combined it into broader categories, um, they found that wildlife was dominant. And so um, this type of analysis does give you very high resolution, high resolution for your samples. So um, I mean, they were identifying you know, raccoons versus coyotes um, versus deer. It's a very specific resolution. Um, and then when they combined it all into wildlife versus human versus livestock versus pets, um, they found that wildlife was dominant. However, 30% of the isolates were from uh, dogs and cats as well. And they ended up using these results. Um, they were able to make some statements about you know, the, the different sources, but they could not use them in their actual load, or load reduction calculations. So case study two was here in Wyoming. Um, used the ribotyping, which again, library dependent, culture dependent. Source discrimination is 15 sources. Um, and this study was conducted in Fish Creek and Flat Creek in Teton County. And MST was used as a source differentiation tool to identify um, appropriate mitigation strategies. So there was um, some concern over high fecal contamination of these surface waters. So this used, uh, this did use an existing library at University of Washington, but they supplemented it with um, fecal samples from their watershed. Study design was bi-monthly from March to November in 10 different sites. So they identified 686 E. coli isolates, 6% of which were unknown. Again, no single animal was dominant when they collapsed it into broader categories. Um, they found wildlife to be dominant and were able to use that information to kind of direct how they wanted to apply mitigation strategies. So the third case study I want to talk about is based on this um, project that occurred in California, the Source Identification Protocol Project, or SIP. Um, basically, California beaches are an important economic and recreational resource. Um, beach closures result in losses of up to 100 grand per day. So this study was designed that would provide a basis for recommending best MST measurement tools. And they evaluated 41 MST methods at 27 laboratories across the country um, and were able to identify um, markers for several fecal sources. And then they, they used this study to kind of supplement investigations into fecal contamination at several different locations uh, throughout the state. So I'm going to talk about one of those case studies specifically. So the method here is qPCR. Um, the lower Arroyo Beach watershed in Santa Barbara County had some of the highest FIB levels of any county. And they used MST to identify sources and drive implementation of BMPs. So this was actually a two-year study. And it started with a um, watershed reconnaissance that was ultimately used to inform the study design. So one thing I want to emphasize here, and that Melissa also talked about, is 
really having a, a good understanding of your watershed before even using MST is pretty important. Um, and watershed reconnaissance, you know, all I mean is looking at historical water quality data, actually characterizing the land use. Um, it's kind of just ta it's a taking a common sense approach. It's getting out in your watershed and saying, you know what, there's high E. coli in the water. What are the potential sources? Um, so that was the first step. And they took the results of that watershed reconnaissance to develop hypotheses that they tested for a season in 2012. Um, and the original hypotheses, I believe, uh, targeted humans, dogs, seagulls, and horses. So they went out to several sites and they tested for these specific markers. And then based on those results, they refined their hypotheses again for their 2013 study, um, which involved fewer sites and fewer markers. So this is, you know, when we talk about a tiered approach, this is, this is kind of how it works. It's, you know, doing a step-by-step -step process, um, kind of using less expensive methods first and really only using the more expensive methods when, you know, you already have a pretty good sense for what's going on in the watershed. Um, and their hypotheses for the 2013 study were confirmed and that human dogs were found to be the dominant sources and they were able to um, apply mitigation strategies. So some of the primary limitations of MSC, um, uh, limited standardization and methodology or how the results are reported, making comparisons between studies difficult, um, poor understanding of fate and transport of FIB, host specific indicators and pathogens in the environment. I think that we, that, that Melissa talked a lot about this and, and you know, there's still, this is still very much an active field of research. Actually, all of these limitations are, in, are actively being researched and hopefully will be addressed um, relatively soon. So poor understanding of how these indicators are distributed among sources and how that distribution may change over larger geographic scales and time. So again, the importance of, of how our spatial and temporal scales play into um, not only our study design, um, but what our results actually mean. No proven correlation between host-specific indicators and pathogens. Um, potentially pure ac poor accuracy levels in many of the methods that, again, Melissa's talked about with our specificity and sensitivity, so false negatives and our false po positives um, can vary from, from lab to lab and study to study. Um, and there's also still some significant analytical limitations, um, such as PCR inhibition. But again, these are being addressed, um, but currently that's, that's kind of where they stand. So in light of these limitations, if you are considering using MST, some of the things that uh, you want to think about before engaging in it, um, you know, has a preliminary watershed analysis been, been conducted? Have we characterized this watershed to our best ability? Um, have we identified specific study questions and project goals? Is it a tiered approach? Um, why was this chosen uh, MST methodology selected? Does the study design incorporate appropriate spatial and temporal scales? Do we have appropriate quality assurance, quality control procedures in place? So one thing I would definitely recommend doing before um, engaging in, in an MST study is to, to develop a QA, QC procedure. So something that, that is going to ultimately make your data more robust so, and less, like, less easy for people to poke holes into. Um, MST method selection will vary but the use of qPCR is one of the more well-developed tested methods and has seen substantial support by experts, which I think we've seen from Melissa's presentation. So who is conducting MST analysis? So just a quick note on laboratories. I know when I first got into this field, um, trying to find a lab was, was kind of a nightmare. Um, <laughs> 
and the one that I ended up selecting, it was a lab in New Jersey, I uh, did not have a great experience with. So um, the cool thing though is that you guys have the, the public health laboratory here that we're going to be hearing from soon, which is awesome. Um, and then as far as, as commercial laboratories, I mean some of the big names out there, Source Molecular, Microbial Insights, um, you know, the lab in Washington State, they're definitely doing research, but before committing to a lab, you know, just call people up, ask them about their methods, their markers, their costs, their turnaround time. Um, I know that there can be substantial differences in what uh, people are charging to run basically the same analysis. So that kind of research is really important. Um, something else I found help helpful is you know, asking to see sample reports beforehand to make sure that you're getting data that you know what to do with. And it's not just, you know, you get a report and you're like, ooh, I have no idea what to do. And the lab's kind of like, well, sorry. Um, definitely um, look at those sample reports beforehand. Cost allows, consider using more than one lab to verify results. And that's definitely getting a little costly, but it'll only make your, your findings that much more robust. Um, the use of academic labs, um, so the one thing I'll say about that, um, that's, this is just from personal experience, is that, um, you know, they're not, they may not be as quick at the turnaround time um, as most commercial labs is, is kind of what I found. They're kind of working on their own, on their own schedule, which is cool because they're all, I mean, they're, they're doing great work, but um, that's just something to consider. Um, using academic labs just as a, as a resource though to, to talk to other or, you know, experts in the field and kind of get feedback um, is certainly helpful though. Resources, um, kind of just if you're sort of just dipping your toes into microbial source tracking, I think a place to start, um, EPA has two pretty solid documents out on it. Um, there's also this um, textbook, which I found very helpful. Um, and then again, the, the SIP project, they have a whole manual out on um, how to, uh, you know, kind of own the whole tiered approach. That's really helpful. And then I know a lot of the, several of the conservation districts in Wyoming are doing MST studies. So definitely reach out to your peers and kind of get their feedback on what their experience has been. I think that more than anything is probably, um, you know, the, your most valuable resource. Questions? Question on QAQC. Um, it doesn't seem to me like it would make any sense at all to do duplicates because every sample you take is going to be a little different. Do you have any comments on that or suggestions on that? I mean, taking duplicates are you can't duplicate your sample, I guess. Well, but, but the amount of difference in those duplicates can say a lot. I mean, if it's like 100% different, then yeah, you got an issue. But I mean, if it's in the range of, okay. you know, so I, I, I think that those are pretty, pretty important okay. for sure. Yep. How, how much uh, factor does bacteria, like in, we found some instances where we were experiencing with the scouring the sediment that was having higher fecal rates than actually during when the cattle were out on the range. And it, and it seemed to me like the bacteria taxes the sediment and then it went scatters out. Is there a life frame for this bacteria that it can live or can it live for hundreds of years in the soil, in the sediment? What's the deal on that? Um, Melissa, you may be able to answer this more appropriately than I can. So the problem with um, fecal coliforms, FIV, that you're, you're looking at is that um, Yes, they attach themselves to sediment. There's plenty of evidence that shows that that bacteria loading in s sediments are tend to be tens of orders higher than what you find in the above water columns. So when you redistribute the sediments, you redistribute the bacteria. Um, in terms of persistence in the environment, it can be forever, basically, with you know quotations around that because these organisms are capable of replicating outside of the host. So the organism that you just collected in your water sample and grew up in the lab is replicating all the time. 
So it's not the same individual bacterium that got pooped out of the cow. It's, it's great, 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 great grandchildren. So how long does your progeny last into the future? Yeah, it's a serious problem because we could be doing best management practices, but we may not be seeing a lot of results. So the idea should, you know, the idea is that if you reduce the regular loading, fresh sources of loading being put in there, and um, eventually you know, things decline quite a bit. So you'll have several log reductions after multiple generations. So you might have started with a, you know, a TNTC situation, you've exceeded thresholds, but once you get out in space and time, if you don't have additional contributions, your numbers are gonna to start to attenuate. And that's what you're looking for. That's why you do geometric means. That's why you do longitudinal studies. You're saying, am I getting a decrease in there? Yes, I'm still finding it, but is it getting lower? And if it's not getting lower, it could be that you still have something that's feeding in fresh source. And how long does that take? before you start seeing a, a decrease? Is that, is that going to be immediately? Is that 10 years down the road? Or? It depends. Uh, I, as I said 500 times, it depends. <laughs> so it depends on the environmental conditions. Is it cold out? Is it the middle of the summer? What are your flow conditions right now? Do you have overhanging shady trees which don't allow for a lot of UV penetration? It really does depend. And how, much, how long it takes to decrease beyond detection levels really depends on how much you start off with because we're talking about log reductions. So you're talking about going from a million down to one, you know, that might take a longer period of time than going from 10 down to one. You see, we have a lot of beaver in our scripts and, and obviously they got to contribute to the situation too. Beaver poop. Yeah. <laughs> and, and it just, amazes me because you go for 10 years and maybe have this under control and then we have one huge flood event or five group good we can have the situation back full rolling again yes, that's what you're telling me. Yes. but it's also i mean if you're consistently monitoring it's going to be easier to and you have you know a good robust data set it's going to be easier to sort of tease these things out yeah you know, yeah so you can kind of better understand what's going on anything else all right, well, thank you all for, for suffering through that with me. <laughs>